God bless you guys this morning. It's just an honor to be in God's house. Um, I like Elsie doing transition. I like it. Amen. Um, it's good like starting off with no sweat, you know. <laughs> Pastor Dale, you did an amazing job opening service. You read like 16 verses, bro. <laughs> I, I leaned over to Elsie. I said, he went Pastor India on me this morning. Amen. Praise God. The Lord's good. I want you to open up your Bibles this morning. Um, we are jumping right back into the series we started back, I believe, it was probably in April, titled Roots. The last sermon that I preached on it was on May 5th, but now we're back, amen, on Roots. Um, and we're just, um, there was a lot of teaching that went forth, amen, a lot of foundation that we laid down. There's, it's impossible to go back, and, and but I, I want to read you the, the two scriptures that we've been using, and hopefully to refresh and kind of bring you back to where we're at, and then we kind of take off from there this morning. Amen? So under the topic of roots, um, Colossians chapter 2, verse 7 will be the first scripture. And we've been reading this scripture. Every time we start talking about this, I'll read this scripture. And it says like this, let your roots grow down into him, referring to Jesus, and let your lives be built on him. Just like the song, this is wild because we... We sing a few songs this morning, and there's like it all has to do with what God is wanting to relate to us this morning. And then it says, then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. <laughs> let your roots grow down into him, and let your lives be built on what? On him. Not on the news, on him. Then your faith. Is the result will grow strong in what? In the truth that you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. It's a powerful scripture. I mean, we could just read that over and over and over. Declare it over your mind, over your heart, over your marriage, over your family, over your finances, over every situation. That if you place your faith, if you build the right foundation, growth or strong growth would happen what? Naturally. If you eat the right things, you will gain what? The right results. It will never fail you. Amen? So it's important. First Peter, and this is where we left off. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 3, New Living Translation. says like this. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all kinds of speech. I remember the last time we spoke, I said, it's something that you have to get rid of. It's not just going to go off. It's not, you're not just going to wake up one morning and be like, I just decided to, no, no. You have to get rid of it. Say, I have to. Get rid of it. You have to. It's not my job to do it for my spouse. It's not my job to tell my spouse, hey, get rid of it. It is your job. It is her job. Amen. Get rid of it. Hypocrisy, jealousy, and all kinds. Unkind speech. Anybody, are, I'm, I'm just going to say this. Don't respond. Don't even look to your side. <laughs> Any spouse have ever been spoken. Look, I'm not even going to look up. <laughs> no, I am going to look up. Amen. As a spouse at times, you know, we get irritated with each other. And, and we speak with unkind words. Jessica's like, no, not me. Okay. Okay, I'll talk to Jared after church. You know what I mean? <laughs> we all do. Guess how you fix it? Get rid of it. It's not the church. It's not your therapist. It's not your counselor. It's not your, your best friend's job. The Bible says you have to get rid of it. Be done with it. And then it says this, like newborn babies, you must crave pure milk, pure, pure spiritual milk. So that you will grow, listen to this, into a full experience of salvation. And then it says, cry out for this nourishment. Now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You got to do what? You got to cry out. You have to desire it. Now that you have had a taste of it, you have to desire it. To the point that you are willing to do whatever it takes to gain the fullness of what God has for 
for you. I want the fullness of what God wants or has for my marriage. So I got to go after it. It's not going to happen by chance. It's not going to happen because I tell Elsie, you got to do the work. No, no, I have to go after it as a spouse, as a husband. I have to go after it. Why? Because I want and desire the fullness of God's blessing for my marriage. So I have to be willing. I have to take it upon myself to, to be willing to do whatever it takes to get to where I need to be in order to enjoy the fullness of God's blessing over my life. Amen? We all good still? Amen. So let's jump into the new scripture, Psalms 18, verse 36. This morning, if you're taking notes, I, I titled this Footprints. Footprints. It's funny how the Lord speaks to me, but through every situation, through anything that I'm doing, it's like these things just kind of pop out and they stand out. So I was literally um, making rice on Saturday for a party that we were catering. And um, I enjoy looking at, like, America's Got Talent, like these people that sing and do, like, this wild. I just look at the highlights, you know. So I, I really enjoy it because they'll go up there and all the, like, the golden buzzer things, you know what I mean? I'm like, you have this very weird person that goes up on stage and you're like, oh, this is going to be good, you know. But you never expect it. And then this voice comes out and you're like, what in the world? And you have to, you know, look at it again and look at it again. And everybody's just blown away, right? But I, I was looking at this and there was this gentleman that goes up there, young, probably in late, maybe late 30s. And the moment he walks on stage, he had a huge crowd of people that came to see him. So they just like break out in this outroar of like, yeah, you know, just cheering them on, whatever. And he goes up there, and, and this, one of the judges turns around and is like, what happened? And who, it, who is this guy? So as he goes up there, he's asked the question. It's like, why are you doing here? What led you here? And what is it that you want to do with your gift? And he says these words, I want to live a footprint in this earth. And, man, the Holy Spirit is like, I'm over here stirring the pot. You know what I mean? Like, it's like the Holy Spirit that kind of punches you in the gut. And it's like, oh. It's like this son better be good. You know what I'm saying? But I love his heart that he looked at his gift and says, with my gift, I want to leave a footprint on the earth. Title of the sermon this morning, Footprint. Because we all have a gift. We all have something to leave here on earth. We all have something to use. The Bible says that we are all part of the body of Christ, but we're not all the same part. We all offer something. We could all contribute. And if you don't know what it is that you have, you better be asking. Because at times that's why we sit back. That's why we just want, we have this mentality of just receiving because I don't know what I'm supposed to contribute. But when you know, you're like, I have to live a footprint here on the earth. So we title it Footprint. I, I want you to walk out of here understanding that I am called, chosen, set apart to do great things here on the earth. And every time you go to scriptures and you read scripture, you, I am reminded that I am here for a task, I'm here on assignment, that there's something that I have to offer to the earth that once I leave, it will live a footprint on the earth for someone to follow. Amen? Anybody have a desire to do something great for others to follow? Come on, we're called to do that as the church. We're called to do that. There's things that we say like dress to impress, right? You know, anything that you do, do as a highlight. Let your presence be known in a room. You walk in and there's people that are so full of energy that they walk in a room and it's like it could be hundreds of people there. They kind of just stand out. It's like a spotlight just on them. There's people that sing and don't even have great voices. And when they sing, there's such energy that comes from their life. There, it's like there's something that they're called to do that, that puts an imprint in life itself and impacts people. And as believers, man, we've been washed with the blood of the land, we've been bought by the highest price. Come on. The God of the universe chose you and I to live an imprint on the earth. 
So when people look at us, when people rub shoulders with us, what type of imprint are we leaving behind? The ground that you are standing on, I'm talking about your home, your neighborhood, your job, the stores that you go to regularly, what type of footprint are you leaving behind? If we, if we were to ask the people that hang around with you, speak to you, that are friends with you, hey, what do you know about this person? What would they say about you? You can say, man, I'm doing great. No, 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 I'm not talking about what you say about yourself. What, are pe what do people say about you? You ever had that fear? It's like, oh, I hope I don't run into this person. Don't look at me like that, Kike. I'll throw you under, bro. It's like, man, what do people say about me? It's important. Amen? Come on, Psalms 18, verse 36 says, here's this promise. It says, you enlarge my, my path under, under me. Listen to what it says. So my feet did not slip. That's a promise. It's like, Lord, you, you enlarge. I, I, I believe... Um, it's a, it's a kind of crazy kind of faith. I believe that sometimes the ground that we're standing, the Bible says, it's mine. It's ours. God enlarged our territory, right? So I believe that as I contribute and use my gifts here on the earth, God would allow me to step in grounds that don't belong to me, but I, while I'm standing there, the Bible says, it's mine. So we walk around with this authority, right, with this faith believing that what God says is mine, it's mine. I don't care who owns it. You ever walked around, there's, there's like crazy kind of be believers that, that would just lay hands on people and just saying hi, but in their minds, they're probably like coming against all kinds of devil and believing that as they lay hands, God is going to provide healing. Carmen is like, you, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it, because it's true, we have that type of power and we have that type of authority that we could lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. So I'm like, I'm laying hands in the name of Jesus. I might not be saying it because you don't believe it, but I believe it. That as I lay hands, I have the authority against what's in you. Come on. And I believe it just like the psalmist says. You enlarge my path under me so my feet did not slip. Joshua chapter 3, or verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> Very familiar scripture says, I promise you. What I promise Moses, this is Josh speaking to Joshua. He's like, hey, the same blessing, the same promise that I gave Moses, I give to you. That wherever you set, you set, you set your foot, you will be on land that I have given you. Isn't it important? It's important that you set your foot. Footprint. You do it. And God says, if you move your feet, that land is yours. That's the type of faith we're talking about. Like, I know who I am. I know what God has called me to do. And I'm going to set foot. And I really believe that as I do that, that he will honor his promise. He has to. I don't got to show off. I just got to show up. I could do that in silence. I just show up. I'll just step in a room. I'm like, I don't have to scream. I don't have to yell. I just got to show up. As, as dads, sometimes we just got to show up to our house and the chaos just quiets down. You just show up. I don't got to put out the belt. I don't got to lay down discipline. I just got to show up. Sometimes I do that to my kids and I'm just like, what? Who needs a weapon? Who, who needs to be whooped? And they're like, we didn't do nothing. I'm like, okay, my authority's still good. You know what I mean? Like, I also do that when the cousins spend the night, and there's a bunch of like bunch of kids running around. I'll just stand in the room. He's like, who needs a whooping? And I'll go in there with the belt, and they're like, and I'm like, oh, I'm just messing. You know what I mean? God is good. That's the authority that God has given us. Amen. Praise God. And God made this promise to Joshua. It's like wherever you go, wherever you set your foot. It's like that land becomes yours. Come on, we're chosen to do 
great things here on earth. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. This is out of the, the Passion Translation. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14 says, We have much to say about this topic, although it is difficult to explain, because you have become too dull and sluggish in understanding, to understand. For you should already be professors instructing others by now. But instead, you need to be taught from the beginning the basics of God's prophetic oracles. So in other words, you are, you are walking underneath what Christ has already declared over your life. It's like by now you should be teaching other people. By now you should identify. You should know your identity to the point that people are sitting underneath you learning what it is to be a child of God. And he's like, by now, you should have it together. He's like, but yet, man, you are like dull. You're, something is missing. Something is happening in your life. He says, you need to be taught from the beginning. We got to start all the way. Hey, any trainers in the room in your job? When you train people, you walk people through this process of training how to do a job properly. And then at the end of the training, you kind of let them go and release them. And then you have to go back a week later and reteach them. Isn't that frustrating? Any, any wives ever like taught your husband to do something? And then you have to reteach him again? Don't look at them. I, I got this towel, and I, I, I have used for smoking, for smoking meat. And every time I wipe my face, I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait till after church. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's not a good, I might, like, scrub my face and use like black tar in my face, you know. But every time I put it, I was like, it smells, I just lost my train of thought, you know what I mean? <laughs> to be trained again, you know. Don't bring that towel here. Hey, praise the Lord. But as husbands, we are trained. We are taught to do some things. And, and in our minds, we're like, come on, the moment you leave, I'm going to do it my way. Because my way is better. And we're so stuck in our ways that even in the natural is a reflection of the spiritual. We are so hard-headed. We are so much full of pride that in the natural, it reflects an area of our spiritual lives. These two areas are never the opposite. The natural and the spiritual is never the opposite. There's a scripture, I believe it's the book of Hebrews, it says, God cannot be what? Mocked. Everything a man sows, he will what? He will reap. There's another scripture that says like we, we could fool each other, but him, we can't. There's another scripture that says that, that a, a, a water or a fountain cannot produce what? Two different kinds of water. It's either going to be sweet or it's going to be bitter. Our soul, who we are here in the natural, can never be the opposite of who we are in the spiritual. God could look at us directly and be like, I know what the problem is. You might, you might try to fool the pastor or your wife or your spouse, whatever it is. But me, you can never fool. The natural is always a reflection of your spiritual life. How many failed at the gym already? Come on, I'm, I'm raising my hands. If I could put the mic down, I'll probably put both hands up. You know what I mean? Because we struggle with discipline. We don't fit in our clothes, but we don't want to admit that we struggle with discipline. But isn't that a reflection of who we are also in the spirit? And that's what this verse is saying. It's like, man, you ought to be teaching somebody by now, but yet I have to go back and teach you the promises of God from the beginning. So we walk around with less of the authority than who we really are in Christ. As sons and daughters. 
On Sundays, we try to do the best that we can in discipleship. We try to do the best that we can with teaching you the word and giving you the promises and letting you know who you are in Christ. And having you, we, we spend time here and there. And we, we answer phone calls. And, we, and we, there's times that we got to look in the mirror and speak to ourselves. Come on, get yourself together. And it's this constant struggle of like who I'm in Christ and who is it that the enemy is trying to tell me. And I know that it's a lie. And I still choose to believe the lie. Come on. So that's what this verse is saying. It's like, man, let's get this together. He says, you are like children still needing milk and not yet ready to digest solid food. For every spiritual infant who lives on milk, listen to this, is not yet pierced. By the revelation of righteousness. What does this mean? By the revelation of right living. So if we're still craving milk like kids, what it's really saying is like, I don't really have a revelation of right and wrong. I, I'm just still ignorant. I ain't ready for solid food because I don't want to commit to doing the right thing. I, I'm not ready for some steak, you know what I mean? Be, because I, 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 I'm not ready to commit to the right thing. I, I'm not ready to serve because, because serving would, uh, would push me to a place of discipline. And I have to do the right thing. And I'm still kind of dabbling in both lifestyles. So in other words, I don't know what he has done for me. I don't know my true identity. So I'd rather act like a kid so someone feeds me. Come on, we all have, some of us have children in this room. How, how many know that by, by the time your kid can pick up that bottle, you, I don't want to hold it? <laughs> by the time you can wipe your behind, I ain't touching it. <laughs> if you walk in, I ain't carrying you. If I train you on the bicycle and you want to get off the bike because you're tired, you're pushing it. I'm not. <laughs> by the time you're 17, 18, you get your own job, you pay for your own things. And by the time you leave my house, don't come back. <laughs> don't call me for gas money. <laughs> and then you went out to the show. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> You know, we laugh, but that's how the Lord looks at us. It's like, oh, you still want milk? You still want to be cuddled to go to sleep at night? I do. I do. Come on. I'm married. I got a license. Praise God. I don't want to grow up in that area. You know what I mean? <laughs> Elsie's like, you don't stay. Stay in the word. But the Lord feels like that about us. He's like, man, I'm giving you spiritual nourishment. I am expecting you to grow up. Man, the word is so good. For every spiritual infant who likes, who lives on milk is not yet pierced by the revelation of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature. So what does it mean to be mature? What does it mean to be mature? Whose spiritual senses pierce heavenly matters. Man, there's other translations in here that the New King James says, whose spiritual senses have been trained. What? Trained. Spiritual senses. Let's, let's just read on. Whose spiritual senses pierce heavenly matters. And they have been adequately trained, past tense, but what they have experienced to immerse with. Understanding of the difference between what, what is truly excellent and what is evil and harmful. So what does it mean to be mature as a believer, as a Christian? To know what's right and wrong and choose the right thing. You can't do that on milk. You can't do that. You cannot be mature and lazy at the same time. You cannot be mature spiritually and still gossip. 
You cannot be spiritually mature and still cheat on your husband or your spouse or your wife. You cannot be spiritually mature and then cuss your kids out. And we could keep going down the line. We cannot produce both things. You either have it or you don't. And the process is going all the way back to the beginning of learning who God is and what he has done for you. Come on, we are living in a footprint here on the earth. What kind of print are we living behind? Because if it's mediocre, we can't expect something that's excellent from something that we just say. Eh. We ain't talking about church. I'm just talking about life. People around us should see God in us. In everything that we do, people in this world should see God in us. You see the reflection that he created us with in his image and his likeness. Well, I, I, I'm not perfect. That's an excuse. Well, I'm going to make fl flaws. Yeah, yeah. If you know what not to do, you shouldn't do it. The Bible calls it a sin. And we shouldn't do it. And if we continue in that path, the Bible says, we're just like little kids, man. So then the territory that we as church, come on, we as church, Big C Church, not Come Alive Church, Big C Church. The territory and the promises of God that belong to us, we will never be able to partake of if we're still little children. Come on, God wants to trust us. He wants to trust us with what he wants to get to us and through us. Praise God. Now we're ready. Second Corinthians verse 11. Second Corinthians verse 11. Listen to this. This is a good verse. Paul speaking, he says, and, and you have to read the whole chapter to, to understand this, but listen to this. For they are not true apostles, but deceitful ministers who masquerade as special apostles of the anointed one. That doesn't surprise us. For even Satan transforms himself to appear as what? As an angel of light. So Paul is addressing the church here and he's letting them know not everybody who stands and gives a prophetic word is actually of right apostle. Not everyone who leads actually is from God. It's like, hey, there's going to be a time where many are going to come claiming that they come from the anointed one, but they're not. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. I just want you to remember, Satan transformed himself to appear as an angel of light. Satan comes and to appear. To mess us up, to confuse us as an angel of light. When I was studying, Ezra was watching a Marvel movie, um, and, and he was watching, I think it was Venom, movie Venom. And there was a part in the movie, every time that Venom speaks, he's like, Whoa, and they, there's like this very satanic kind of voice. And I look over there and I'm like, bro, that sounds satanic. Like, that's crazy. It's this voice. And, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I'm, I'm in the kitchen, like, stirring that pot. You know, that right, big rice pot. And the Holy Spirit is like, no, no, no. The, the devil never comes with that scary voice. He doesn't show up like this huge monster and, and scaring people. He doesn't. The world and culture itself has taught us, right, the scheme of the enemy is to make you feel that that's the way that he shows up. But in reality, he doesn't. He's like, man, if I could portray this image on, 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 on movies, if I could portray this image in Halloween, if I could portray this image, then I have this image of this being this horrible person, this horrible monster. I'm going to scare the, the living out of you. But the reality, he doesn't show up that way. 
He shows up as an angel of light. Someone who you're like, hmm. Jesus says this, Matthew 7, 15 says, Be aware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep. He says, but are really vicious wolves. Man, when you read this whole prayer, when you read that whole chapter, you understand. It's like, but they come disguised. I'm telling you, the enemy is here to fool you and me, even with what seems like to be the truth. He will quote, he will quote scripture. He will tell you exactly where it is. He will tell you things about Jesus. He will, he will come to, to deceive you and I in believing like this is the right thing to do. Now that's scary. And his end plan is to destroy the purpose of God in your life. The footprint. It's to destroy it, to annihilate you. To get you out of the game. To push you away from God's purpose in your life and living your footprint behind. You know what it looks like? I was hurt by church. I will never serve again. That's a lie. You could sit in church surrounded by hundreds of people and you're like, I just feel disconnected. But you're the, first, you're the last one who arrived and the first ones to leave. But I feel disconnected. It's a lie. And the angel and, and Satan will show up as an angel of light and he, he will remind you nobody loves you, nobody calls you, nobody texts you. Look, nobody, nobody has even reached out. Blah, 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 and, and disguises himself like it is the truth, but it's not. And he will have you so focused on self that you will forget that you were called to live an imprint on the earth. Come on, he comes as an angel of light. At one point, Peter grabbed Jesus and said, hey, hey, we got to hide you. We got to put you away. They're about to kill you. Come on. Why are we going to that town that's looking for to kill you? Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. He was trying to do the right thing. He pulled out his sword, cut the guy's ear off, and Jesus picked it up, put it back on. What are you doing, Peter? The same man that fell asleep when Jesus said, hey, let's spend some time in prayer. Because the enemy will show up as an angel of light. And he could be cute and put a skirt on. Come on, single man in the room. He could be cute and put a skirt on. And deceive you to your worst nightmare. Come on, young girl in this room or single woman in this room. He could dress really nice and he could look apart and be like, he has everything I ever wanted. And you are being deceived by Satan himself. Here's another trap of the enemy. And, and here we're going to kind of like set this little foundation and then we'll, we'll continue on in this topic. He will deceive us in how we eat. And we deal with all kinds of sickness that we want to we wanna medicate and we don't want to be disciplined on what we eat. I'm talking to myself as I'm smelling barbecue, bro. <laughs> but his purpose is to kill your body. And if you and I are sick in our bodies, we can never fulfill God's call in our lives. You know, the crazy thing is, is that it doesn't happen from one day to another. It doesn't happen from one day to another. It is a plan set out for us 
years in the making. And the enemy is so patient. He's like, don't worry about it. He's 15. He's 16. He's five. She's five. She's six. She's seven. Doesn't matter. Like, but I'll, I'll see when he's in his 30s, he'll be so sick in his body, he will never be able to fulfill the assignment and the call of God's life in their lives. And I've spoken about this in this church before, but my dad died at 63. My mom, at the same age, 63, they're about four, four and a half years apart. And they both died at 63. Doing the will of God. My mom never woke up one day. She had a massive stroke in her, in her sleep, never woke up. My dad passed away from a diabetic coma. One took a little nap, the man never woke up. Just a week prior to that, we were having conversations about vision and everything that he felt called to do. He's still on earth. He's like, man, I can't wait to be healthy in my body, to go back into Mexico. And because I feel that God is not yet done with me. And then a week later, he passed away. And in my mind, I'm thinking, like, why? I have an uncle, the same thing, heart disease. I have... Um, Uncles that are called to be in ministry and dealing with this crazy sickness, diabetic. I mean, you name it. We, had, we Just in my family alone. Then I asked myself the question. It's like, what am I doing that I'm not seeing because he comes as an angel of light. That I am introducing into my body that now... Or in the future could keep me from fulfilling the call of God in my life. I want Lily to come up. Um, and Lily's just going to bring some information to us this morning about heart disease. Because it is the number one cause of death here in the United States. And a large percentage of heart disease is even unknown. So in other words, like people out of nowhere have a heart attack and boom, they're dead. And the, and the, the signs are unknown. Some people have a little chest pain, their arms go numb, their, their face, something is happening in their body that signals, hey, something is happening. But some people don't. The large percentage of people that die from some type of heart disease is unknown. Isn't that wild? So, Lily, can you help us this morning? So, I'm just going to go over just a few things about um, heart disease. So, as Pastor Indio mentioned, heart disease, it is something that can affect all of us. It's sometimes unknown. It's sometimes things that have happened in the past that you have had for a very long time without knowing. Um, heart disease is something that affects your major blood vessels in your heart. So all the major blood vessels in your heart are affected by heart disease. And heart disease is just a broad general term. Um, heart disease can sometimes be affected in a way where um, you can either have a healthy heart, you can have an affected heart, you can have what we call a defected heart from probably from, from the time of birth. Some area of your heart gets affected, right? And this is what causes heart disease. And some of the causes um, of heart disease can be due to high blood pressure. It can be due to um, high cholesterol. It can be due to smoking. Um, so a lot of time, a lot of us, we go to the doctor, right? You may go to your annual checkup. And when you go to the doctor, what do they do? They do a, pretty much a regular physical. They check your heart. They check your lungs. But then they also send you for blood tests, right? And sometimes we think like, well, I'm pretty good. Everything, you know, seems fine. But heart disease is considered a silent killer. That a lot of times we can be walking around feeling just fine, like I'm okay. My blood pressure is, you know, I feel good. But then when you go in, it's like, whoa, I didn't even know I had this high blood pressure 
or I didn't even know I had um, high blood sugar. And these things are caught, right, when you go to the doctor's office. That's why I will say, just a side note, very, very important to go get checked. Yes, we believe in God that is the healer. We believe and trust in God. But God also gives us wisdom, right, wisdom to go get checked um, and to make sure that everything's okay. Side note. Um, but with the heart... A lot of times I say it's an example as if when you put gas in your car. So when you put gas in your car, there's different types of gases, right, that you put in. There's certain gases like unleaded, premium. I remember one time I went with Elsie to go put gas and she asked me, what side is your gas tank? I'm like, I have no idea. Ron again always takes care of that. Um, but there's certain um, gases, right? And it depends on the gas that you put in the car would depend if your, your car functions correctly, right? So sometimes we can put a gas, uh, gas in the car and it will either start, it will mess up, it will miss, right? Certain things that can affect your car. In the same way, what is it that we are putting in our bodies? What is it that we're putting in our heart that causes these issues? And a lot of times, one of the major ones that causes heart disease is high cholesterol. So high cholesterol, a lot of times, it can be hereditary, which that's another thing. A lot of the issues, diseases that happen can be hereditary. But that's the thing that we need to talk about, too, because it can also be generational. And those are things that also can be stopped. But as we continue on with cholesterol, it can be hereditary. It can be either the foods that you eat. A lot of times we eat a lot of greasy foods, fried foods, um, foods that are really not too good for us. So in time, what happens is that all builds up. So in your arteries, and I basically explain this to my patients, in your arteries, your blood flow is moving through your heart very smoothly through all your ventricles, through all areas of your heart. And your blood should be moving smoothly. But when you have high cholesterol, and this is something that you get checked in at um, the lab or at the clinic, they check what they call your lipid panel. So they check your full cholesterol, total cholesterol. They check your good cholesterol, your bad cholesterol, and your triglycerides. So one of them is your bad cholesterol. So the bad cholesterol and your triglycerides, the majority of the time is due to the foods that you eat. So when that is high, basically what happens is that in your arteries, instead of your blood flow moving smoothly through your heart, plaques start to form. And when those plaques start to form, instead of your blood moving smoothly, what it does is it's moving and then it kind of gets stuck. And it keeps going and then it gets stuck. And when that happens, that's because those plaques form in your arteries and you have an increased risk for strokes, heart attacks, and blood clots. And that happens, and a lot of times we're walking around and we have no idea that this is happening. So very, very important that we look into that. Another thing, too, is a lot of times, and I've seen it time and time again, when patients come in and they have the high blood pressure, they have the... the um, high blood sugars and chronic pain, um, chronic fatigue, things that are happening that it's like, why is this happening? A lot of times it can be as simple, let's just say blood sugar. We're trying to control that blood sugar. We start with one medication. They come back. Their blood sugars are still not controlled. We put on a second medication. Then we put on a third medication. You do three top medications. Now insulin comes in. So you're doing one thing after another after another, and nothing is getting controlled. So that's where you start to think, what is causing this? So when this happens, whether it's blood sugar, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's chronic pain, whether it's fatigue, this is where we have to say, aside from the medications, what is the root? A lot of times I tell my patients, it's like putting a Band-Aid over a cut. I'm not going to continue to give you medications because that's putting a Band-Aid over a cut. Let's open up that Band-Aid and let's look into the root. What is causing it? And a lot of times it's like if they come in with anxiety or depression, it's like, yes, there are times, chemical imbalances, things that can happen 
that you have to give medication for that. But then there's other times that it's like, before we do this, what, what is actually going on in your life? Talk to me. That, what, what's going on? Are you under stress? Because one thing is we all go through stress, right? Every day there's stress. But then there's sometimes stress more than the norm. So when it's stress more than the norm, then let's get to what is the cause of this. Because a lot of times when it's depression or anxiety or, or chronic fatigue or chronic pain, I have patients that come in with a lot of pain and we send them to specialists and we put them on medication and nothing is helping. So then we come to look like what is the cause of this? What is the root? So it's very, very important to look into that. A lot of times I'll send them to, you know, um, the psychiatrist or the therapist. And I am not against any of that. I mean, I'm in the medical field. But a lot of times before I send them to the therapist, I'll say, I'm sending this patient to you. But please get to the root. Get to the root of it. If we have to give medication during that time, it's good. But let's get to the root of it. Amen. Um, a lot of times also we tend to, whether it's different diseases and things that we go through, a lot of times we go to right away, let's give me medication. You know, we go to the doctors and we say, give me medication for these symptoms. And you know, a lot of times the medications that we take, they either have to do with either something with our head, it has to do something with our chest, our heart, our lungs, it has to do something with our stomach or it's related to our back, most of the medications. But what I want you to understand is that most medications, not all, okay, but most of the medications that we take, they are dealing with something that we have not dealt with in our soul. Most of the medications, and I would just want to repeat that, not all, okay, not all, but most of the medications that we take, are dealing with something that we ourselves have not dealt with in our soul. And it's very important that we look back, that we step back. Because a lot of times, yes, there is a need for medication. But a lot of times we need to step back and say, what is the root? What is the reason why of this? You know, we, we could look at a teaching like this and, like, turn off what we're listening to. But it is all over Scripture. The first sin, Adam and Eve, dealt with what? Food. And look at all the mess that you and I have to deal with, right? Because mankind, mankind fell. And what was it that the enemy used to entice mankind? Food. The woman looked at it and says, it is good to eat. It looked pleasant to eat. You go back to the story of Jacob and Esau. He gave his birthright. For what? A plate of food. He was hungry, he was sweaty, he was desperate, it smelled good, and he gave his birthright. We're still at war with this nation today for a plate of food. As Israel was traveling from Egypt to the promised land, what is one of the things that God told them not to do? Don't go and mix yourself. What did God put them in, in, in through the desert? What was the kind of diet that God gave them? And what was it that they murmured and complained about all the time? Well, back in Egypt, we ate. We had stuff to eat. Food. What happened to all these people that left? The Bible says that every single one of them perished in the desert. And when the last one of them died, God called Joshua. He said, hey, let's get, let's get on with this new generation. What was the one thing they struggled with most? Food. Number one sign of sickness is what we eat. 
what you put into your body, eventually will produce a fruit of either health or nutrition or sickness and disease. Why do we talk about this? Because there's things in our body that we're asking God to heal that he is demanding for you and I discipline. And if we cannot be disciplined in our bodies, we will never be disciplined in our spirit. I'll prove it to you. If we were to call a fast, come on. What is the one thing that in your mind you're like, I don't know if I should fast. Why? Like you want to see the bad side of me? Take away a cup of coffee. <laughs> Come on, it's simple. And automatically we are so addicted to caffeine, to sugar, to a burger, to grease, to all this junk that we put in our bodies. Man, I'm preaching to myself. That the, main, the moment they mention a fast... We won't do it. In our minds, we already quit. Why? Because of food. So when you go to scripture to look at the word fast and the effects of fasting in scripture, we see the greatest miracles. We see the biggest turnaround. We see God do amazing things through what? What is fasting? You set aside what? Every time God wanted to show up to Israel, he told him to do what? Fast for three days and three nights. And then after that, I'm going to show up. I need you to consecrate yourself. Why is it that in the natural, it has so much effect into the spiritual? And if it's important to God, it has to be important to us. So the enemy would put a mask on this area of our lives. Because he wants to take you and I out. And as long as we could create excuse to justify our actions, we will never do or fulfill the fullness of what God has for us. We'd rather get medicated. How do you get through it fast if you get coffee? Give me a Tylenol. Give me an Aleph. I don't want to deal with this headache. Come on, I'm talking to myself. And a cup of coffee would, would push me to the point that I give up my fast, give up my breakthrough, give up on God because I got a headache. Food has a control over our lives. I'm telling you, and, and we might not... I will continue to prove it through you through scriptures. Esther is a queen. And the, and the people rose up against us to destroy all the Jews. What did they do? What did she feel the Lord ask her to do? Put everybody on a fast and prayer. What are the number two things that the church don't like to do? To pray and fast. I'm telling you. Jesus started his ministry. He started with what? The Holy Spirit led him where? To fast. Because we couldn't have a weak Savior. He would have never be able to endure the cross. Come on, if he didn't have his diet in check. If he wasn't strong enough to carry the cross, he would have failed at his assignment. Come on. My God is not weak. And there was a reason why he wasn't weak. Many times the, the, the disciples approach him and say, hey, bro, we haven't eaten. He's like, go eat. And he will retreat and go to a prayer prayer. We see the story of Daniel. He says, I ain't going to contaminate myself with the king's food. He's like, just give me fruits and vegetables. That's another excuse. Well, if I'm going to fast, I'm going to do a Daniel fast because at least he's eating. That's how much control food has over our lives. 
and we are stuck. We cannot fulfill. We cannot perform. We cannot act right. We are dealing with all kind of health issues. And, and all we need is discipline. You don't need an oily hand. Yeah, yeah, can God do miracles? Absolutely he could do miracles. But you and I, if he does that miracle, we will go right back. And in a year from now, we will be in the same situation. And it's not that God is not powerful enough. It's that, that we, you and I, don't have the discipline that is required to stay healthy and to be mature in our Christian walk. Let's stand up to our feet. We'll just pick it up here next week. Father, help us. Today I want to talk about, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the heart. We're going to get into this. Because I believe that God is going to give us revelation. That is going to lead us into a place of living a life that's disciplined. So that we may experience a higher level of glory in the spirit. I'm telling you, man, the Holy Spirit knocks, hits me like left and right. And it's as simple as like, man, I, I, I want to talk to you, but your mind is just on chips. I'm asking you to spend a little time in prayer. And even the moment you kneel down, you're thinking what your next meal is going to be. I'm talking about myself. If I don't have that sugary drink, if I don't have that Coke or that energy drink, then I don't know if I can make it through this job. Come on, come on. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking about an addiction. That's stronger than drugs. It's sugar. Try living without it. Just the thought, be like, I would be miserable. Cleansing my body, oh, man, that's horrible. You know that most of sickness and disease will start in your gut because your body cannot fully like undo everything that happens in your gut like people can't use the bathroom right you can't sleep right you feel bloated you have pain gut health that's where it starts that's what a lot of time when you go to the hospital though they, they will put you on like iv give you just fluids and let you go for about three days trying to clean your system out you know what i call that fasting i, I want you to think about it And you're like, I'm dying to get out of here to have a plate of food that got you there in the first place. The food is terrible in the hospital. No, it's really what you should be eating. Come on, come on. I'm talking to myself. I have gone to the hospital and I had a bill of $1,500 for an hour that I was sitting there. And all they told me is that I was dehydrated. But it cost me $1,500. Why? Because I'm trying to hydrate myself with coffee and pop. And I'm doing God's will. Like I'm working in the church. I'm moving around. I'm flipping this building. We're about to have church. We're believing God for salvation. And I'm in the hospital doing God's will. Because I have a lack of discipline in my body. And then we sit back and complain, but God, you didn't show up. You didn't do a miracle. No, no, no. I did it to myself for lack of discipline and stupidity. I was sitting there for about an hour, hour and a half. Just... And I'm like, what's the result? Nothing. Everything looks good. You're just dehydrated. Go home. Get some rest. Get some rest. Yes, I got an excuse to get rest. But the reality is you take so much caffeine, you can't sleep at night. Your mind is constantly moving, going, 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 going. 
You're so stressed about life that leads you to sickness. We're, we're talking to a couple this past week. I'm not going to mention their name. I'm not going to throw them out there. And yes, we're closing the service. I'll have the prayer team come up. But I just want you to go away understanding that if we don't put these areas in our life and check, you will never be able to experience the fullness of what God has for your life. Even doing ministry. Couple here at the that came to the house. We enjoyed nice. We had we had a nice dinner. And then she she began to express how she was losing her hair. Every time she showered, she was just losing her hair. She had gone back and forth to the hospital, trying to find out and different tests and this and that, whatever. She was just losing her hair, blah blah. blah. The end result, after a ton of money and all this research, they said stress. What do you do for a living? I work in ministry, stress. So much worry, so much control. Now she's dealing with physical illness in her body. Yeah, I'll, I'll hit the guys for a little bit. And I'm just going to be blunt and transparent because we're in church. And as a pastor, I'm going to tell you the truth. I know of a brother that was married. He was married and he could not function in the intimate side of his marriage. And he was in his mid-30s. So he'd rather resort to what they give you to help you in that area than take care of his health that produce him being inefficient in his home. So we could sit here and talk about people being unfaithful and doing all this, but we don't want to take care of our health so we can take care of our spouses. We want to condemn fornication and adultery, but we're contributing by the simple fact that we don't take care of our health. And the Bible says to the men that whatever need our spouses have, we ought to fulfill. So whatever it is that I need to do to take care of myself, to be able to function, I have to do it. Come on, we could talk about sin. And the reality is that a lot has to do with what we intake in our body. We want to see the result. We want to see revival. We want to see transformation. But we don't want to be disciplined with the simple fact that let Adam and Eve fall away from God's grace. Food. Guys, it was the first sin. Food. Because it looked good to the eyes to eat. It's simple. God wants to heal your body. God wants to restore your heart. God wants to heal all your diseases. But do you really want to be healed? And are you willing to do whatever it takes to maintain your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost? Man, we didn't even get to that scripture. Your body, the Bible says, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I said your body, my body, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. Praise God. I am glad that it's a fruit of the Spirit. And if I allow the Spirit to rule in me, it will naturally produce it. Close your eyes this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity this morning to be exposed to truth of your word, God. I thank you, Father, this morning you are exposing the tactics, the, the schemes of the enemy. Father, I thank you that your word reminds us that he comes as an angel of light. Father, but the end result is to destroy our lives and our purpose here on earth, Father. We believe, no, understand, we, it has been known to us, Father, that we've been called, chosen, set apart, anointed to do great things here on earth, to live a footprint everywhere we go, Father. We believe and declare that the land is ours. We believe and declare that, that what you have for us is mine. Great marriage and, and amazing family. I thank you, Father God, that the doors of, and the windows of heaven are open and your blessing is being poured out upon us. But God, I want to enjoy the fullness of all that you have for me this morning we simply cry out for help for father in this area in our lives we need the leading of the holy spirit god father we need help we pray father that this word 
we're not just staying at a place of conviction, but we will gain revelation that leads us to application, to a transformation of our lives, that everywhere we go and what we've been called to do, we could fulfill to the fullness of your heavenly glory, God. Father, let the earth see your glory through us, God. Through our discipline, through what we do, how we live, what we say, what we eat, what we don't eat. Let your glory be magnified through our lives, God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we believe that there's power in your word. And we declare that same power to be in effect and in control in our lives, in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our emotions. Have full control in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. I just want to open up the altar this morning. If you're in this place, man, it could be from the, even a place of salvation. God loves you so much. And the Bible says that he gave his only begotten son. And that's where we start. It's understanding who we are, what he has done, and where he has recovered us from. He wants to save you. He loves you to the point that he wants to save you, but not just leave you there, but transform you into the image of who he is. And that every day, that, that work of the Holy Spirit is transforming us into his image. So let it happen, but it starts with salvation. It starts with surrender. It starts with us laying our lives in the altar and allowing God to do what he needs to do in our lives. And then we walk by faith. Believing what the word says. And believing that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And if you're in this place and you're like, man, I need some discipline in my life. I need a, I need a Holy Ghost kind of moment. I need a Holy Ghost kind of transformation touch. I'm just going to invite you to come up as we dismiss. Receive prayer. Build a connection. A lot of times all we need is accountability. Hey, this is who I am. This is what I need. Can you hold me accountable? Can we do this together? We are a family of believers in search of one goal. And that's the image of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what, we cannot do it without the help of the Holy Spirit and the, my God, and the accountabilities of our brothers and sisters. You can't do it on your own. We need to be held accountable to each other and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Church, we love you. God bless you. The altar is open. We are here to minister and pray with you. But we're believing that we're in a season where God is going to do some amazing things. And I want to be a part of it. Amen.